It was now more than a month after the MT Phoenix stranded on the 26th of July 2011. There was a fourth attempt waiting and imminent. So on the 30th of August, I decided to assess the progress that has been made and walk to the site of the stranding once again. It played off in the quiet upmarket suburb of Sheffield Beach in the town of Polito in the province of KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. The geographical position was shown under the video and if you copy and paste it into Google Earth Pro, it will take you there. While you're at it, please subscribe and ring the bell and press like. This will help to keep you informed when the next episode is published. This is actually the last episode in this series, but there will be more on ships. We were on the beach just after 3 p.m. If we, I mean my daughter and me. She was on a school holiday and was visiting me for the holidays. There were quite a few people around. My daughter was the girl in the pink top. She was playing around on the rocks and in the sea and a lot of my footage was just about her and the relationship to the ship. If you watched the previous videos and refloating attempts, which is highly recommended, you will now notice that a rope bridge has been added from the ship to the beach. That must have taken a huge burden as well as cost factor of this project. Previously a helicopter was used to lift crew on or off the ship. In the water there was a cormorant that may have been there to find something to eat. They are most of the time people shy and stay away from them. But it may be that in activity food became more available and that is probably why we see it in the shallow waters. What we clearly don't see is any presence of a pulling cable. The anchor chain also hangs loose from the porthole in the bow. Clearly no effort would be made that day to pull it off. So we have just set a scene towards such an effort. But preparations should clearly escalate as soon as possible if the refloating has to take place at the coming spring tide. The 1st of September is spring day in the hemisphere that I live in, the southern hemisphere. Curiosity kills the cat. We were there again late afternoon, my daughter and me. Coming down the wooden stairs towards the beach, the first thing visible was the smitha mandla in the late afternoon sun. Things looked a bit different. The cable was reattached and it was clearly applying pressure. The cable was pulled tight. There was no sign of the smith sianda. The Smith Amandla is specified to have a bollard pull of 181 tons. That is a unit of measure that is used to find the pulling ability of tugboats. Amandla is a salvage tuck and there are specific requirements that applies to it. It has to have two cable winches and must be equipped with a main cable and a spare cable. It is specified to have two friction winches with static loads of 320 tons and 180 tons. It incorporates pulling winches. The cable is defined based on the bullet pull ability. The cable obviously needs to be capable to handle the max pull so that it doesn't break. The cable length is 2000 meters which explains why the tuck lies so far away from the empty phoenix. Except for the two cables of 70 millimeters and 58 millimeter diameter it also has another spare of 70 millimeters so that should be plenty to work with. As we have seen in the previous videos the cables were not up to it on two occasions and it snapped. In the last case, it appeared as if the anchor chain that it was attached to dislodged. It is obviously only as strong as its weakest part. A lot of people were enthusiastically walking towards the stranded ship in the hope for action. We all knew it was now just going to be a matter of time, but we were not sure when as we were not all privy to inside info. The fact that the Amandla was pulling hard did not necessarily mean that it was trying to dislodge the ship. The purpose was also to stabilize it so that it does not move around. The ship was laying on a bed of rocks and any movement was detrimental to the hull which already had a hole in it. Again, we waited till after dark for any action but nothing was forthcoming.
almost a month after the previous attempt, on Friday the 2nd of September 2011, the final refloating exercise on Empty Phoenix was to commence once again. The refloating required a swell of at least 2 meters. New moon passed a few days earlier and the spring tide was still dominant. It was anticipated then that inclement weather from the south would hopefully contribute to the effect and the peak of the tide was going to be at 6.27 p.m. The idea was to swivel the empty phoenix around by pulling the bow away from the beach to face seawards. We have talked about the bollard pull of the Smitha Mandla just now. On the 2nd of September we were greeted by the sight of both the Smitha Mandla and the Smitha Sianda as we arrived on the beach. And something was different. Both were attached to the ship with its own cable. This answered the question of the difference between two tugboats being connected in serial or parallel. The Amandla with a bullet pull capability of 181 tons and the Sayanda with 97.8 tons, so over half the strength of the Amandla. There are two winches on the back of the Sayanda and both has a thousand meters of 64 mm SWR cable. Although it hasn't really been used as such, the taxi Yanda is also designed for oil recovery in case of spills. It has two storage tanks in which up to 135 cubic meters of pollutant can be kept. The weather was a bit cool and we were dressed warm. There was definitely talk of a refloating attempt on this day. The peak of the tide was going to be at 6.27 pm and that would again be after dark. More than a peak of the tide, a choppy sea was expected to help in this. The pressure was on for a long time but eventually it was abandoned and word was going around on the beach that it would commence again from 5 a.m. the next morning. The morning peak of the tide would be at 6.45 a.m. but it sounded that anything would be taken if a ship comes off the rock bed earlier. So at 5.30 a.m. on the morning of the 3rd of September we arrived to find a gathering of people that were present on the street viewpoint on the hill above the ship. Plenty more were also assembled on the beach next to it. Some even brought their own chairs. It was still fairly dark, but the light was increasing. We went down to the beach and I set up my tripod. I took my first photo at 5.45 a.m. There were lights on on the empty phoenix. She was a lady and waiting. Would the phoenix rise again from the ashes? The swell was quite good and had the promise of results in it. Of course, the swell previously pushed the ship to point straight at the beach, the path of least resistance. We want the swell to cause loft and for that to happen the swell should hit the body harder and more direct. If only some original movement can happen, the ship would become more favorably placed as she moves into the swell. Two straight cables emanated from the bow of the ship and they were going towards slightly different directions to the right. The cables are attached to chains that emanates from the front porthole. I think the attachment of these chains were probably the weakest link in this process as we have seen with the previous unsuccessful refloating attempts. First we saw the Smith Yanda and then slightly further on lay the Smith Amandla. I shouldn't say late as she was pulling very hard and you could see it from the way the bow lifted up above the water. These tugboats sit very deep in the water which give them better grip, so to speak, and it looked as if the water boiled where they were. Here we can see a closer look at how these cables were attached to the chains. The two separate cables to the two separate tugboats were tight and the engines of these boats were working at high power. If the ship budged at all, they would be ready to go. There was no ready set in this story, but logic told us the best chance would be at the peak of the tide. As we said before, this would be at 6.45 a.m., basically an hour from when we arrived. One of the popular questions is why was the cables not attached to the stern, the backside? Surely the stern lies deeper into the sea and it should come free much easier, but that is not really true. When the ship stranded, it came in with its stern first and that hit the rock bed and it was solid on it and then the whole ship swiveled around until the bow was pointing beachward. So the bow side is under less pressure and it should come loose there first. 
This already happened in a previous refloating attempt, which was the second time before the cable broke as the stern remained stuck as the ship swirled around. Here's the Smitsi Yanda and the cable that is visible is of course the one that goes to the Amandla. Thus we had stronger pull parallel to the beach from the bigger tuck Amandla and the Sianda was trying to establish the swivel. As the engines on the Smith Amandla went to full throttle, its bow raised up again and again and it appeared as if the engines were sweeping its power, basically hammering the cable and the ship. I suppose that may also put additional pressure on the cable, but we have to assume that the cable should be strong enough this time. The small crowd noticed. First sign of movement eventually occurred at 6.20 a.m. as excessive and higher swells started to push against the hull. Jolts of excitement was noticeable from the people around us. Everybody was concentrating on the ship and its bow. The swell aided the tugboats quite a bit as there was obviously some loft with it which reduced the friction. There was now progress and the ship started to swivel in little steps as was planned in concert with the hammering that came from the tugs. From 621 uh, we had movement all of the time. Not so much gradual but rather as in jerks as the waves came in. Watch the movement every time the surf hits the ship. It is clear as I said and it became easier as the ship became transversal to the line of the surf. At 6.24, the cables pulled quite straight forward from the bow. It would make sense then if the tacks moved deeper to get more leverage. The movement was still swiveled around the stern as it was still stuck as I have suggested before. Somewhere in catching this we lost our focus on the video, but we are sure you will forgive us. At 6.27 the bow of the Inti Phoenix was pointing seawards and the effort was now focused on pulling off its stern. Biggest challenge now was that stern side and the last thing that we wanted now was for the cable to snap again. But with two very strong cables in place and with the ship already in a favourable position the refloating would still be possible. Seeing also that the ship already responded so well to the swell before the expected peak of 6.45 am there was every hope that, that that stern will just lift it ever so slightly soon to make a release possible. And then it happened. At 6.51, the combination of the cooperating swells lifted the empty Phoenix stern just enough to facilitate the forward pull by Smith Amandla and Smith Sianda. The release was not smooth. We can see how the ship is dragged on the rocks underneath and that it responded in jerk-like fashion as the waves came in. But the surf was good and the swell high enough and we could see that this was going to happen.
next thing, the ship was making for the waves. The people were in excitement. Many were relieved that the annoyance was gone. I had rather mixed feelings. It was like saying goodbye to an old friend forever. And it turned out that this ship was still going to change my life in many ways. In a sense, I can state that the day when this ship came in, it was also the day my ship came in. The empty Phoenix was without cargo and some equipment was removed which contributed to an uneven weight distribution. We noticed this clearly as she moved away to her destiny. As the empty Phoenix was lying in a flat bed of rocks and a deteriorating hull suffered the consequences of the beaching and all the attempts of moving her, she was not without damage. She had a gaping hole in a hull of about 3 meters by 6 meters when she left. The only reason why she stayed afloat was because the hull was sealed off above and a compressor was pumping air into it to provide counter pressure against the water. The full detail of the decision to sink her is not known to us, but the bad state of the ship was obviously one of the reasons. The scrap metal option was discussed in public so often, but it would not have worked without a yard to do it in. Definitely not where she was lying, as the community would never allow it. The terrain would make it difficult for traffic to come close, as it already was, and it would thus be very disruptive. There were earlier discussions about scuttling her in any case, as ships like this are ideal for reef growth and to simulate sea life. I was told that it would make more sense to sink it in very deep waters. At depth, the water is at high pressure and very cold, and the combination of that would cause all possible remaining pollutants to effectively become solid. It did make sense. And at depth, it is highly likely that she would be a threat to other ships or traffic of some kind. The Natal witness stated on the 6th of September 2011 that the empty Phoenix oil tanker was towed to a final resting place about two kilometers below the surface of the Indian Ocean and some 78 kilometers southeast of Durban at around 6 p.m. the day before. The actual geographical coordinates are referenced under this video if you want to look at it in Google Earth. They also quoted Subantu Titai, the executive head at Samsa Center for Shipping Services as follows. The removal of the empty Phoenix was crucial to ensure the safety of our environment and the protection of a new tourist destination on the KZN North Coast, Sheffield Beach near Salt Rock. If you want to see a photo of the scuttling, I suggest you click on the link under the reference number 12 and 18 in the source list. Many stories surrounded this ship. According to the shipping database, it previously went by the names Consel Pride, Henry Ney 105, Kirei um, a G8, and the Fujitsuku Maru 83. It was originally built in Japan in 1974. Shipscene.com claims that it used the call sign Empty Concept in the last known signal received from it on the 13th of July 2011 on the way to Durban. How true this is is unclear, as it was also claimed that she was already on tow by the Smith Amandla on the 8th of July. So who paid for all of this? The South African taxpayer again. According to the IOL article labeled 18 in the source list under the video, Captain Sarur Ali, the regional manager for the east coast of KwaZulu-Natal for Samsa, said the cost was 39 million rand to the taxpayer. It was impossible to find the owners of this vessel and therefore there was no insurance or other money going to be forthcoming. It may be worth your while to read that article if you have any further interest. Thank you for watching my series of videos on the whole Empty Phoenix Saga. It is a remake of my original video on this matter called The Refloating of the Empty Phoenix Tanker. This time I've spent much more time on it and on the details. If you like them, please subscribe to this channel. Uh, I hope to bring you more interesting videos on ship salvaging as I have interesting material um, but I need your support to make it worth my while. The story of the Smith Armada is also not over and needs to be told again. And 2021, just after 10 years have lapsed, I went to the spot where the empty Phoenix had stranded and I made a quick monument with a stack of stones. Almost like an offer to the ocean as the next day the ocean already destroyed it in annoyance. 
But it brought back so many of those memories of those years and of the video that I've made then. See you on the other side. Thank you very much.